Okay. Um, so I'll talk about dual processes and um, my, my, my current attempt to think about them at what I call a micro scale level. And I'll tie that to the theme of this conference via the idea that uh, control of oneself can be hard in two very different ways that might be illuminated by thinking about dual processes at the micro scale. There is a longstanding idea that the mind houses systems or processes roughly corresponding to the idea of reason on the one hand and intuition and passion on the other, and somehow they vie over control over thought and action. The charioteer uh, metaphors are prevalent in different uh, philosophical traditions. Uh, in the medieval tradition, you have a strong notion of the will combating sensual appetite. And since uh, we are in Switzerland, uh, not uh, where Freud had uh, a substantial influence, um, uh, we shouldn't leave him out. <laughs> in the contemporary behavioral sciences, these approaches are called dual process views. And it is fair to say they are ubiquitous. Uh, I was gonna do a bibliometric analysis where you count citations and there is literally no point in that. You're gonna get into the six digits uh, if you're counting carefully. Uh, they're in JDM, judgment, decision-making, social cognition, motivation, bias and prejudice literature, moral judgment. Um, in psychiatry, they're absolutely ubiquitous. Um, the outline of the talk is, I'll very briefly sketch traditional dual process views. I think many people are uncomfortable with them, and there's been a rash of criticism. And, and then I'll put forward uh, a view that I'm developing, the micro scale dual process view and then I'll link it to the issue of uh, things being hard. You can hear the crying in the background. I assure you, my children are well-treated. The issue is too much peanut butter on a cracker or something like that. It's not anything more serious than that, I promise. The traditional way of specifying a dual process view is in terms of these paired features. It's kind of essential to the view. So you have um, deliberative style of thinking, and then you have the intuitive emotional style of thinking. Many times they're reified and placed into different compartments in the psyche. They generate responses and there's control or suppression uh, between the outputs. And then there's a list of adjectives that are paired. Different theorists offer different uh, paired features. On the deliberative side, slow, serial, intentional, controlled, and so forth. And of course, effortful is uh, almost always endorsed as one of the features of the deliberative. On the intuitive side, it's the opposite or the negation and effortlessness is taken as a core feature. And uh, in my own uh, writing in, on self-control, especially uh, earlier, uh, I, I drew very directly from this kind of tradition. And, and now I'm thinking backwards and saying that wasn't uh, maybe optimal. In terms of criticisms of dual process views, they are um, now very prevalent. And this uh, review by uh, John Barge in uh, Tix, Trends in Cognitive Science in 2018, already very highly cited. And the title uh, almost expresses the kind of disdain, the mythical number two, <laughs> and, and then the flatland fallacy. So it's not just that these views are wrong, they are mythical and fallacious. Uh, the latest one from um, Denise, I think that's how you pronounce the name, that was just a few weeks ago, and it says dual process views are untestable. And, and so there's just a lot of criticism out there. Um, in, in the longer talk, I would have gone through systematically what the criticisms are. I'm just going to say an example of one because it's easily the most common. The claim is the misalignment problem. And this, this says, when you look at actual instances of thinking, you find that these paired features that are supposed to distinguish the two modes are cross-cutting. You'll see episodes of thinking that instantiate uh, type one features uh, that, that is automatic and type two, that is the deliberative. As an example, a cue in the environment, a cigarette ad primes or unconsciously activates a goal. Um, so Barge is an advocate that that kind of thing can happen. Uh, goal to smoke, but once activated, the goal leads to slow sustained serial planning. That's type two just in one episode. Here's another one. Uh, and um, you're deliberately searching for your keys all around different places in your house. It's voluntary serial search, but the activation of the, the goal of the key renders key jingling in another room spontaneously um, drawing attention. 
that's in one episode of Unfolding Thought, both uh, features are present. Okay, that's actually all I'm gonna say about traditional dual process views and their criticisms. There's more to say, of course, but I actually wanna to get to the positive view because I think that their elements are arriving that allow us to construct a, a more suitable dual process view. And, and so it's my ambition to create such a view and uh, this will be a thumbnail of what that view looks like. So the overall approach, um, so just to give you a, ro a roadmap of what I'm gonna do in the next you know, five, 10 minutes, it goes like this. I'll begin by characterizing a basic unit of thinking. I, I think that's a crucial um, step to make in, in better understanding cognition and thinking. Carve it into what are its basic units. And I'll actually say that the, the, the correct unit to look at is something called a basic decision. And I'll show that there are dual processes that operate right there at the level of basic decisions. Um, and then I'll give an account of thinking as ensembles and sequences of these basic decisions where um, dual process, processes can operate at each of these decisional nodes. So that's a kind of roadmap of, of where I'll go. What are these basic decisions? I get them from the large and rapidly growing literature on sequential sampling models, which have really emerged as the preeminent approach for studying the generative processes underlying what are called speeded decisions. So these are decisions that unfold in roughly about 300 milliseconds to 1.2 seconds. Um, and they're studied in tasks like this. So this is the gold and, and, and Shadlin task where these dots, the arrows means they're moving on the screen. Here, they're moving coherently to the right. Here, um, less coherently, but to the right. And here, they're, they're moving in different directions, only weakly to the right. You're in a task and you're presented with these stimuli. And this is the model that is used to uh, uh, model the, the, the properties of reaction time of your responses. And the model has many parameters, but the crucial one is this one called the drift rate, which measures, so the, the picture is that there is a decision variable here that is accumulating evidence towards one of the two, and, and this is a response boundary. This boundary means choose right, this boundary means choose left. That drift rate is evidence accumulating towards one or two, one or the other of these response boundaries. And when the um, evidence accumulates efficiently and hits this threshold that represented by the response boundary, you, that, that is the micro level substrate of you doing a person level thing. You decide that the dots are moving in one direct direction or the other. And this V parameter is absolutely crucial for philosophers it plays the role of something like what philosophers would call an action desire, a desire to bring about a certain response straight away. Straight away. And so it's a uh, computational counterpart of a miniature thing that is discussed in the philosophical literature, but it's below the typical folk psychological level of explanation. It's something smaller, although I, I, I believe still at the person level. There are other parameters at the, of the model, and I, I won't discuss those any further. The interesting thing about these SSM type decision processes is whatever we study, whatever domain we're looking at, we keep seeing these kinds of processes emerge as excellent fits for what the data looks like. So what do I mean by that? Well, I just talked about these perceptual judgments. There are lexical decisions. You ask people, is this a word? So you're asking them to access their semantic knowledge. Memory decisions, like this over here, where you're given some study items and you're later asked, is one of these a member of the, the study set? Motor initiation and stopping decisions. So this task right here, where I'm, I'm showing is the stop signal task, where you go on certain trials and hit a response. You have to do the motor initiation. On other trials, you have to inhibit that response. There are attention allocation decisions. So this is a visual search task and you have to find the red T. It's in a sea of other kinds of stimuli. And so the, the way you solve this is with serial search. Value-based decisions, which have been very extensively studied recently. Choose the carrot or choose the candy bar. Perspective memory decisions. I don't have a good visualization of that, but this is where you hold some future intention in mind where you perform some other task 
or working memory updating decisions. So this is the so-called NBAC task where you have to update working memory. All of these cases, SSMs provide excellent fits to the underlying decision process that underlies your performance on this task. Okay, here's the next step in the argument. There is strong and convergent evidence that two different types of processes, automatic and controlled, make contributions to the drift rate. So remember, the drift rate is an analog of a miniature action desire. And there are automatic uh, ways in which that action desire's strength is generated. And there are controlled ways in which the strength of that action desire is modulated. So there are controlled and automatic contributions. Um, just to give a flavor of what the automatic contributions look like, stimulus discriminability is one important driver of the strength of drift. So highly coherent arrows, strong drift, not coherent arrows, weak drift. Training, associations help determine drift. So if you train somebody that they're going to get a large reward for choosing a blue triangle and a small reward for a red square, on the test trials, you will see very strong drift towards the choice for the blue triangle. So those are some things that determine drift, but they're considered automatic contributions. What about the controlled contributions? The best way to see how those operate is in these so-called conflict tasks, where there is an automatic response tendency, and then there's a a modulation that you have to do on top of that automatic tendency. So the anti saccade task illustrates that nicely. You're looking at a cross, the cross moves, there's a prepotent tendency to look towards it, but you have to suppress that tendency and look in the other direction. When these tasks are modeled with newer so-called conflict drift diffusion models, sequential sampling models, you can dissociate the presence of an automatic process modeled here by a pulse function, which collects evidence in the wrong direction, at least initially, and a controlled process that steadily accumulates evidence to the correct response boundary. So there, the modeling framework is pulling apart the automatic and the controlled contribution. There are other ways to distinguish automatic and controlled at the level of these micro decisions. Here, I'm just going to have to say what the evidence looks like without actually going in any detail. So there's distributional analysis methods that look at complicated features of reaction times across multiple conditions, working memory load and capacity limitation uh, manipulations. There's looking at patterns of individual differences, so automatic contributions and controlled contributions to drift um, differ across individuals in very different ways. And some of our recent papers looking at patient populations uh, discusses that, including a review that we wrote recently. The controlled contribution to drift is also calibrated through cost benefit calculations that are goal sensitive. And today, I have no, uh, many of the speakers will be talking about frameworks that uh, look at this idea. So, what we end up with is a picture like this this miniature unit called a basic decision that involves an evidence accumulation process that has automatic contributions and controlled contributions and generates an internal, typically internal, intrapsychic mental response. So that's the unit that I'm calling a basic decision. Here's the next step in the argument. You might respond, okay, basic decisions. Who cares about those? That's often some peripheral place where math, math, math psych people, mathematical psychologists, are playing around with their modeling frameworks. No, you can't keep basic decisions just confined there. As soon as you um, have this construct, it ends up being uh, lots of directions of evidence push you towards thinking. Basic decisions are the right kind of basic unit for um, cognition more broadly. And so I have this thesis here called the atomic thesis. And what it says is that Basic decisions are the key building blocks of thinking. So think of thinking as sequences of person level mental operations you perform in the kinds of tasks studied in the dual process literature. Um, they do kind of folk psychological tasks where you give a response. Um, thinking understood that way, the right way to think about it, I'm claiming, is that it involves sequences of basic decisions and their associated responses, okay? Why would you believe that? 
I'll give one quick argument and then I'll, I'll gesture towards other lines of evidence that point you in the direction. The quick argument is what else could it be? Or it, it's a kind of argument about the pervasiveness of basic decisions. Take a kind of functional analysis of what thinking is like. Here's some of the things you do when you're thinking. Direct attention to a certain feature of a vignette. Attach a framing to the vignette. Retrieve a schema from memory. Identify the consequences of a certain action. Assess the value of a certain outcome. Search for an alternative option. These are exactly analogs of the kinds of things studied by uh, people applying sequential sampling models to um, judgments and decisions in various domains. It's just hard to see how you're going to get an account of these things on the right without appealing to these things on the left. Okay, there are other arguments as well. In fact, there are four arguments. And like I said, I'm, I'm chopping and uh, trying to focus on what I think is uh, the key material. Um, the other three arguments are, there are, are some models of serial cognition, and they clearly implicate basic decisions as the critical nodes. There's models of serial cognition learning, and they point to basic decisions as being critical nodes in thinking. And then there's an argument that I call the argument for controllability. And that involves the idea that if you take a look at what in your mind you can control, it ends up being basic decisions are the only, are only candidates that, that are really available. Okay, all right, so the atomic thesis. I've given, I've, I've said what it is and I've given some arguments for it and now I'm just gonna take it as a premise and, and for, to, to derive further conclusions. Um, I don't have my phone. Uh, what time is it? Or how much time do I have? It's 2.20, you, you still have uh, five to 10 minutes. You can take the 10 okay. minutes. Perfect, perfect, okay. So the atomic thesis says that basic decisions are key building blocks of thinking. And forgive the cartoonish representation here, but I, I think it clarifies matters. Here is you thinking, and according to the atomic thesis, here are the basic units that you are going through these decisions. And then eventually maybe you have a behavioral response. Let's be clear though, that even though these circles are drawn with one color, they're different kinds of basic decisions, perceptual, attentional, memory related, evaluative, and so on. So these different kind of basic decisions going on in your psyche. Um, take the previous conclusion that basic decisions exhibit a dual process structure. That is, there are certainly automatic contributions to the drift rate, the micro desires at present at each basic decision, but there are also controlled contributions. So what you end up when you conjoin these two claims is a picture like this. At every basic decision, there is automatic contribution and potentially there is controlled contribution. So you have what, what is here, um, you have a different kind of dual process picture, but this is built from the bottom up. We take our mechanistic knowledge of basic decisions and the kinds of influences that operate on them and build upwards to a dual process theory of thinking. Now, this dual th process theory of thinking is different than this one, okay? So this is the traditional one and you can call that a mode-wise dual process theory. At the level of actual thinking, there are two different types. There is the deliberative species and there is the intuitive emotional species. So at the level of the folk psychological construct of thinking, that's where the separation occurs. Um, this is a node-wise dual process theory, not a mode-wise. So at each individual, there's actually only one sequence here. That's your thinking. And at each node within the sequence, there's the opportunity, there's automatic contributions and the opportunity for controlled contributions. Okay, so that, that's the, um, this type of picture emerges if you're able to break thinking up into some kind of tractable unit, you can locate dual processes at these micro level units. And what emerges is, is, is what I consider a more attractive dual process theory. Okay, it would be nice to then go back and look at some of the problems of traditional dual process theory and show how decisional dual process theory addresses those. So for example, I brought up the misalignment problem. 
Actually, misalignment is completely predicted by the decisional dual process theory because there are not two types of thinking characterized this way. There's a very wide variety of thinking. Um, so this is more like a periodic table of thinking where many different decisional units and different combinations with different inputs can generate a variety of things at the level of thinking. Okay. I'll now go to the final stretch where I talk about two ways that control of oneself can be hard. And this gets linked because the traditional dual process theory, which I don't think is entirely wrong, but it suffers many problems, but it encourages you to think of why control is hard this way. There's like this hydraulic relationship between the deliberative system and the recalcitrant opposed desire. And control is hard in the sense that it's effortful and fatiguing to get that recalcitrant, recalcitrant, recalcitrant desire to you know, go back into its pen because it's raging out there. So it's something like that. The decisional dual process view, it, it probably can account for this phenomenon as well, but it opens up a new space to thinking about where control gets applied. And I'm gonna tell you briefly about an experiment we did. Um, we studied the spontaneous stream of thought. Subjects are in a dark, quiet room. They verbalize their thoughts for 30 minutes. It, there's no constraints. They just say whatever is going through their head. We transcribe these thoughts sentence by sentence. And then we apply automated sentiment and analysis to apply to each thought a valence score. And so we were actually talking about data with 20,000 lines of thoughts here. There's a lot of, lot of data. This is an example of what we found. These, are, these represent transition probabilities. Here's an individual with low neuroticism scores. Low neuroticism means this individual, neuroticism is a basic individual difference dimension that uh, is increasingly linked to uh, psychiatric disorders. It's a disposition to have negative affect, especially under conditions of stress. And an individual with low neuroticism, the key difference with, between them and an individual with high neuroticism is the low neuroticism, when they're in a negative thought, they tend to leave it. This individual, when they're in negative, they actually tend to stay within it much more than this other individual. So these transition probabilities are um, locating very basic biases in these basic decisions, which I claim underwrite individual thought items in very, very long streams and sequences. You can picture it kind of like this. The typical individual without the biases might look something like this. The individual who has negatively biased basic decisions, some of their thoughts are negatively biased like this. And you know the time over here, the time scales we're talking is, we observe them for 30 minutes, but they're in their own head all the time day in, day out, in the shower, in, driving to work, uh, when they're listening to me drone on and on, um, they're in their own head and these thoughts are emerging. Keep in mind that distorted spontaneous thought is a central target for contemporary kind of manualized approaches to psychotherapy. Aaron Beck, founder of CBT says, automatic negative thoughts are the proximate driver of depressive symptoms. And he's identifying ways and toolkits of how you challenge automatic negative thoughts. Meditative traditions talk in a very similar vein, although their remedies are somewhat different. So now what, what we seem to have here then is these individuals have a type of control problem. We wouldn't call it a self-control problem, but it's a type of control problem in that they're having these kinds of thoughts occasionally here and there. And I label them yellow. They don't have those labels. When they, when they are trying to understand and uh, combat some of their own biases, they're facing a control problem, but it's a much more difficult one. And the task of synchronically regulating these biased micro decisions, they call it micro control. That's another way that control is hard. It's hard in the sense of being not um, brute strength, hydraulic problem, but it's a problem of uh, being challenging. So think of examples like you have to detect when two planes are about to are, are on a path to collide on a radar screen, or your kid looking where the Easter egg is hidden, or searching for the right word in Scrabble, 
or you know, you're a radiologist and you've got chest x-ray and you've, you're gonna say, which type of pneumonia is there? These are very subtle things you have to find. That's a different sense in which control is hard. We can distinguish these two kinds of senses of hard this way. Hard in the hydraulic sense, um, I, I describe them as being effortful, straining and fatigue. Hard in the challenge sense has a different phenomenology. Perhaps the phenomenology of striving. If you're trying to identify problematic individual thoughts, attentional orientations, memory retrieval operations, and things like that, you have to strive. It's, it's not hydraulic hard. It's a different kind of hard. Success requires skill. And uh, Juan Pablo has talked about this kind of skill in the context of self-control. I'd like to expand it to this broader sense of control. And if you do it, uh, if you do it well, there's a kind of an achievement to it. Failure at control in the hydraulic sense, that's a kind of weakness. Failure in this kind of control, that is the more um, temporally extended one where control is a challenge, that is more about incompetence or ignorance. They also differ in when, when control is not possible, the, the, the uh, uh, opposed uh, um, desire or thoughts and things are not controllable. We would say in the hydraulic case, there's irresistibility. We probably need a different word in the cases where one's automatic thoughts are too prevalent or too subtle and too hard. Maybe we call it discontrollability. So these two senses of control, they manifest in many of the same situations. There's no doubt. So a Venn diagram would find them at least at the manifest level being overlapping. But it is interesting, you can kind of, kind of distinguish them. Okay, so in short, uh, I argued for a kind of different picture of dual process theory that I call decisional dual process theory. And it relies on the idea that thinking can be carved into units that have these automatic and controlled inputs. And I, I gestured to the idea that this is a, is, a, is a better way to think about dual processes than the traditional way. And one thing it does is it, exposes the idea of micro decisions as a problem that a person might face on an ongoing basis and micro control being uh, an important uh, type of control. And I distinguish the hydraulic sense and the challenging sense in which control can be hard. Okay, thank you.